Earlier this week, friends and colleagues paid tribute to longtime CBS News anchor Walter Cronkite. The service took place at St. Bartholomew's Church in New York City, the regular place of worship for the Cronkite family. Speakers during this event include 60 Minutes' Andy Rooney and longtime CBS Evening News producer Sanford Sokolow. This is an hour, 15 minutes. I am the resurrection and the life, saith the Lord. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though this body be destroyed, yet shall I see God, whom I shall see for myself, and mine eyes shall behold, and not as a stranger. For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. For if we live, we live unto the Lord, and if we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live or die, therefore, we are the Lord's. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. Even so saith the Spirit, for they rest from their labors. Welcome today to St. Bartholomew's Church and to the celebration of a great life. Let me ask you a couple of favors, please. One, please turn off anything that makes a noise. And two, please abide by the Cronkite family's wishes that there be no photography or audio recording during this service. Now, I ask you to find a hymnal in the pew in front of you and join in the singing of hymn 608, a hymn chosen because it is the hymn for sailors, hymn 608, Eternal Father, Strong to Save.
Lord be with you. Let us pray. O God, whose mercies cannot be numbered, accept our prayers on behalf of thy servant Walter, and grant him an entrance into the land of light and joy in the fellowship of thy saints. Through Jesus Christ, thy Son, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Let love be genuine. Hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal. Be ardent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in suffering. Persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Extend hospitality to strangers. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves. But leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. No, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. For by doing this, you will reap burning coals on their heads. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. The word of the Lord. The 23rd Psalm, please read along. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. A reading from the Gospel according to Mark. On that day, when evening came, Jesus said to them, Let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd, they took him along with them in the boat, just as he was, and the other boats were with him. And there arose a fierce gale of wind, and the waves were breaking over the boat so much that the boat was already filling up. Jesus himself was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he got up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Hush, be still. And the wind died down and it became perfectly calm. 
And he said to them, Why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? They became very much afraid and said to one another, Who then is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? The word of the Lord.
didn't know where I was going, so I don't know what I'm saying either. You can tell that. <laughs> it's some event when you have to have someone like me speak at your memorial service. Walter was such a good friend. I can't get over it. We met in London. We were both covering the 8th Air Force. Walter was with the United Press, and I was with the Army newspaper, The Stars and Stripes. We printed the paper in London, and he sent his stories back. And they would tell us when there was going to be a raid, if you can believe that, of the, our army. These days, you're lucky if they'll tell you after they've had a raid. <laughs> but Walter and I and all three or four other reporters would get on the train and go out to Bedford. Usually Bedford was the town in England that had five or six Air Force bases around it and we would go and then we would split up and we'd each go to a base that we liked and we'd write our stories and uh, then we'd go back to the headquarters of the Air Force and they had it set up so that we could write and send our stories from there. And that's when I got to know Walter Cronkite, got to know him well. You get to know someone pretty well in a war. I just, I just feel so terrible about Walter's death that I can hardly say anything. He's been such a good friend over the years. Please excuse me. Thank you. Pardon me. It's hard to follow an act like uh, Cronkite. There's been so much about him the last week. I don't know what else there is to say about him. I would like to point out a couple of things. He had this reputation for being call, uh, cool and calm and collected no matter what the circumstances, no matter what the, uh, the occasion. But that doesn't do him any justice. He was really ferocious at times, and I'm reminded of the, uh, in the 1968 Democratic National Convention, when some security agents uh, roughed up Dan Rather on the floor, Walter lost his cool on the air, shouted about thuggery on the uh, floor of the convention, felt embarrassed and ashamed that he had lost his cool that way, but there it was. Next day, in the anchor booth, to our shock, in burst Mayor Daly, madder, madder than could be about what had happened the night before, kicked me out of my seat, sat down, and uh, Walter interviewed him about the events of the night before. Uh, from Walter's point of view, it was one of the low points in his life because he felt he wasn't forceful enough with Mayor Daly and hadn't, hadn't defended the troops and the media and, uh, and the rules of coverage. Then in the fall of 1969, uh, uh, Spiro Agnew, then vice president, delivered his famous uh, attack on the media, the nadering nabobs of negativity, he called, he called reporters, and uh, part of an eastern establishment elite who were neither elected nor selected by, uh, uh, by and we found out that that was the initial attack on the media by the Nixon people. And Walter was furious about that uh, on the grounds that if the media was not going to defend itself, who would? He grabbed Don Hewitt at the time, and the two of them flew out to uh, St. Joseph, Missouri, Walter's birthplace, and had a town meeting with citizens of St. Joseph, uh, letting the citizens uh, explore the whole idea of whether there were, we were n n nattering nabobs of negativity or not. Um, and it caused quite a stir. CBS broadcast that town meeting that night, and uh, it was, it was uh, the event that kind of signaled CBS News out as a target by the Nixon White House. 
but I don't want to get bogged down in all that serious stuff. Uh, there were other aspects of Walter that, <laughs> that would drive, uh, drive anybody crazy. He had this bizarre uh, idea once that he would ad-lib the newscast and uh, without a script, that he would just read in all day long and then get up there and recite the stories that we thought were important enough to report. Needless to say, uh, the director especially was crazed at this idea. There were so many contact points. An evening newscast is the most structured event on television or any sort of media. Well, we tried it, and uh, Walter insisted that when it came time to, to roll a piece of film, he would brush his nose, and that would be the cue to the I, I kid you not, this really happened. That would be the cue to, to the director to roll the projector. And now we're talking about film, not videotape, and in those days it took seven seconds for the projector to get up to broadcast speed. So you had to be really, really tense and tender about this, and we never made it, okay? It was utter chaos. Either, either Walter ran over the film or the film film just didn't come up, and, and nobody knew what was going on, especially um, uh, uh, any, any sort of, uh, of other... Uh, uh, we, it lasted for two days, and we went back to conventional script. Uh, uh, script. Now, uh, then there was a time uh, he forgot his name. The signing off said, this is, and it was a blank. <laughs> a blank. blank. <laughs> And it blank, I'm sorry, blank, blank, blank. Finally, the control room rescued him by, by, by taking it away and going somewhere else. We never did figure out, he never figured out what had happened. Okay. He, he, also, he also had a horrible problem with the second month of the year. He could never pronounce it right. And we'd get all sorts of complaints, this is before blogs and the internet, uh, from viewers either by telephone or mail about his pronunciation of the second month of the year. It got to the point where we would rehearse him for about the last week in January about how you said it. And, 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 it, and it worked for a day or two. And then it, there was a relapse and we went back to, uh, it, was just, it was just terrible. The, uh, the other thing I want, I want to talk about is something called the magic number. Um, if you were anywhere around our newsroom at the time, you'd hear people shouting in the last half hour certainly about something called the magic number. It, it, was, it was a piece of sorcery that was invented. I, I can't claim credit for it. Uh, because Walter, who was very diligent, very precise, he thought, about timing things. It had to do with Walter's time on the air in a half hour, well, actually a 22-minute newscast. And he would time each piece of his copy down to the precise second, except on air, it never matched. And it, of course, it drove everybody crazy. So what happened is somebody with a more mathematical mind than I have calculated how much slippage there was. And so we would tell Walter, we'd give Walter a number that was less than what it actually was. And he would, he would stick to that number, and of course on air he would expand to what we call the magic number. And uh, so we cheated him every day. You know, whether, whether he knew this or not, I don't know. It, I, we never, we never had the guts to talk to him about it because we didn't want to open up that whole can of worms. So, but, but we lived with that for years. Okay. Um, but you know, he uh, uh, he was a lot of fun off camera. You've heard this elsewhere. I mean, he played the clarinet badly, good enough to get on this high school band. And then in recent years, of course, uh, his, his pal, Mickey Hart of the Grateful Dead, uh, uh, brought him a set of drums, which just absolutely en enthralled him. And uh, oh, several weeks before uh, the end, uh, Jimmy Buffett flew his seaplane, landed on the East River, right next to Walter's uh, uh, Riverside apartment, came upstairs, and uh, as Kate told me, opened up this beautiful ukulele case, took out an instrument she, was, she just uh, thought was the most beautiful thing in the world, and serenaded Walter with a little ukulele recital. Um, uh, he was always a wire service reporter in his heart, and he always lived by the, uh, the wire service adage, which I don't think anybody uh, uh, has anything to do with it. Get it first, but get it right. 
And um, one of his first jobs, about getting it right, one of his first jobs was uh, at the Houston Press, where he, he was a copy boy, I guess, a cub reporter. <laughs> he had to get the Houston Bank clearing number every day, and it was published on, believe it or not, on the front page of the Houston Press in a little box. And it was a multi-million dollar number. And one day he got the cents wrong. He put down 27 cents when it should have been 17 cents at the end of a $3 million thing. Well, he got called up and really, uh, really beaten up by the editor. And he, the way he described it, he, he went out afterwards feeling hangdog about it, and all, all of his senior buddies at the, at the nearby bar would say, him, hey, you better get out of town, or, you know, you better be careful. He discovered that, that that little number was the key to the gambling numbers game in Houston. And the last five digits of the clearing number was the winning number, and here he put down 27 cents instead of 17 cents, and his life was in danger. Uh, but, he, but he always used that as an example of the importance of accuracy in, 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 in most, most, most terrific uh, details. Uh, when, uh, at one contract negotiation, and then I'll, then I'll end, at one contract negotiation, he shocked the people, it's the suits at CBS, so to speak, by saying he didn't want to raise, but he wanted three months off. Okay, he wanted a new contract that paid him the same, but for nine months of work. Well, uh, they were just jolted, to say the least, because of the fear of evaporating ratings if he was gone for three months. And uh, uh, the editor at the time, dearly departed beloved John Merriman, came up with what seemed like a reasonable solution. He said, Walter should name his boat uh, Assignment. And so every night during the three-month hiatus, we would say, Walter is on assignment. <laughs> he, he never, Walter never thought that was funny. Okay. And uh, the last thing I'd say is, on the day he left CBS News and became a CBS special uh, correspondent, which moved him out of the, uh, the news area, he accepted an invitation to something called Bohemian Grove, which was a, a camp in Northern California for grown-up men, establishment men, bankers, politicians, uh, serious scholars who went, and it was an off-the-record situation, and um, they acted like teenage boys, peeing on trees and all that sort of stuff. And uh, Walter left the Evening News in March of 1981, and my God, the following week he announced he was going to Bohemian Grove that summer. We discovered he'd been invited for years previous, but felt it was not acceptable, given his role in the news, to go. But once he felt free of the news, he was out there and went there every year. And of course, we don't know what happened, but, uh, but uh, acted like a teenager. Um, and uh, 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 he became a member of the CBS board, of course, and was on there for some years. And he once said to me, boy, you know, you don't know how many ways there are to say earnings per share. We sit there for hours and we discuss earnings per share. Uh, you know, it's, just, it's just remarkable to me. And every time I bring up a question about television, nobody wants to talk to me about it. And, and there we are. And uh, that's a little bit of the Walter I know. I didn't work with Walter. Uh, I was his friend for a long time. And like everyone that knew Walter, I was always asked, what's he really like? And I would answer, he's, he's just the way you hope he is. He was always, I thought, the same guy that uh, most of America uh, guessed he was. He's physically brave and he wasn't as afraid to show his emotions. He was generous, fun-loving, a courtly gentleman, 
and good company wherever we were. To steal a line from Melville, he was my Harvard and my Yale. I learned to think and appreciate and observe the world the way Walter did. I have learned how to handle my own very, very small celebrity, watching him enjoy with good humor and a smile and patience his slack-jawed admirers. Our happy friendship began years ago. We were hosting a fundraiser at my home down in the Chesapeake Bay. Walter and Betsy were the celebrity couple. It was a rather dull affair, actually. And Mrs. Cronkite seemed content. She was whistling a little ditty to herself, seemingly. Of course, all of us that know uh, Betsy's little whistle and the Uga horn on a nuclear submarine might herald the same concern. Betsy was done fundraising and ready to go down to the old Annapolis waterfront to visit a small 100-year-old saloon that I just happened to own. We had great fun that night and spent the next day on the water for the first day of a lifetime of sailing together. Visits to each other's homes, laughter, and lots of adventures. Walter and I sailed our boats side by side or shared the same deck for the next 35 or so years. We had the best seats in the house for the latest Broadway shows and did New York. And let me tell you, with Cronkite, that was quite a ride. The day would eventually come to an end. Walter stuffed 25 hours into the 24-hour day. And late at night, the call would come up the stairwell in the old brownstone up in Yorkville. Good night, old boy. Good night, Walter. Thanks for a great night. We flew to the country house in the vineyard, watched the sunset. We dined with presidents and explored the Caribbean by sail. The family folded me into their life, and I became a trusted and comfortable member. By the way, sailing with Walter on Winty was not for the faint of heart. <laughs> Walter loved the sea, and when more timid stayed ashore, we left our secure mooring and set sail, usually a lot of sail, wind, sea conditions, bah, hoist all sail, pointer seaward, and away we would go. With sturdy windy going full tilt, lee rail under, spray flying port and starboard, the brave crew hanging on for dear life, Walter, hunched over the helm, would catch my eye, grin, and over the racket of the wind, holler, sensational. <laughs> Standing at the wheel of my beautiful old bald eagle, tucked in close astern his boat, reading over and over, Winty, Edgar Town, painted on her stern. I comfortably, comfortably, or confidently, I should say, trailed Walter into probably every cove and harbor in Maine and New England uh, as well. Walter knew them all and couldn't wait to share the beauty and perfection of a hidden cove and show them off as well to his Chesapeake friend. After setting the anchor in another pine-scented cove, rafting our boats together, and after our bodies recovered from the obligatory plunge, uh, plunge in the always frigid main water, the time would come for hot popcorn, a cold beer, while we rehashed the day's sail. Then dinner aboard his boat or mine, with decent wine and never-ending fascinating conversation, whoops of laughter. After dinner, a pipe and a brandy on deck. 
One time, a magnificent aurora borealis flashed across the night sky and seemed to last for hours. We were alert and awestruck. Finally, softly, from Winty, well, good night, old boy. That was sensational. Good night, Walter. It sure was. Every fall, Walter would sail to the Chesapeake. This became an annual boys' sail, eventually manned exclusively by ex-military pilots. They were tough, dependable gentlemen and loved to trade stories with the captain. The problem was, there were too many captains. All of us captained our own boats. We were all either Naval Reserve captains, airline captains, or Air Force captains. Captains from stem to stern of old Winty. So we commissioned Walter Commodore, captain of all captains in Nelson's day. And as you'd guess, Walter uh, had no problem adjusting. <laughs> the rank became commonly used among his friends and family. In fact, when I got the call that Walter lost, Walter lost his final battle, the message was, the Commodore is gone. The Commodore and I sailed through a wild storm on a race to Bermuda. One year, just the two of us on deck while the storm sank the largest boat in the fleet. We shouted our life story to each other while we took turns at the helm. A lifetime friendship bonded that dark and stormy night. Walter was more than a crusty old sailor or iron pants editor, though. He had an antenna sensitive to friends' pain. He knew the words that restored the fun and chased the worry and made things good again. He was the kind of guy who could, openly and without shame, shed tears with a friend when his old yellow lab died. Now my brother, my teacher, my shipmate and pal, it's time for me to say Good night, old boy. It's all been sensational. I love you and miss you so. Fair winds and following seas forever. Rest in peace, my dear old friend. I loved my dad. I loved him coming home for dinner so we could talk about that night's program. I loved riding my bike to meet him in the summer when he drove home to the country house. I loved sailing with him, trimming the sails while he navigated. He was good at that too. Back in the days before satellite navigation, he would get us right to the harbor's mouth after hours in a dark fog. I admired my dad. He was just a reporter, he'd say. He just ended up reporting bigger and bigger stories. He was fast, too. I liked watching him swivel around and rewrite stories during commercial breaks. During the 1960s, when the country sometimes felt it would revert to the 1860s, his reporter's instincts for fairness and accuracy seemed to me to help Americans on both sides of the political fence understand each other. He liked to quote Thomas Jefferson, a nation that expects to be ignorant and free expects what never can and never will be. My folks had lived through the Depression, War and Cold War, before I was born, in the same year as Sputnik. Dad said he walked home from the hospital that morning along the East River, making plans for this new son of his. I think most of those plans came true. 
Thank you, Dad. Thanks for rushing to the side of the boat when the boom knocked me overboard. You stood there ready to jump in after me and then you were glad you didn't have to. Thanks for getting ready to take out my appendix yourself with a sharpened spoon on the plains of Africa, two days drive from a hospital. That time I was glad you didn't have to. <laughs> Thanks for being such fun to work with as you and Sandy Soklo and I went from one small production company to another in the 1990s. Thanks for being such a good role model, doing your homework, being polite, saying to mom as you passed her in the hall or in the kitchen, shall we dance? And then taking her for a few turns around the room. I'm happy for my dad. I'm happy that he had so many interesting and varied friends over the years and that he'd bring them home. I'm happy that he finished his autobiography of a reporter's life before his health began to fail. I'm sorry I insulted him by saying I was surprised at how funny it was. He said I should have known how funny he was. <laughs> I'm happy he had such caring doctors and nurses in his last few years. When we were young, my sisters and I came to Sunday school here at St. Bart's. Four years ago, we memorialized our mom here. Then we went out to Kansas City to bury her. We'll be going back out soon to put dad's ashes next to mom's. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Two thousand years ago, a group of witnesses began to tell a story that proved to be the story about a man who was, as they say, one of the axial persons in human history. The world turned on his soul and his teaching. Now we are here today to commend to God one of his great witnesses. Walter Cronkite, a man, a husband, a father, a grandfather, a friend, a mentor, and someone we would say in our New York religious terminology, a mensch, a full human being. 2,000 years ago, those first Christian witnesses also began to write what they witnessed, and those accounts are the true context today in which we remember him and through which we commend him to God. They give us the words that we need at least to begin this prayer and only begin and to proclaim what we do in this sacred hour. We simply thank God for this good man. We really can go no further because though there were witnesses at the resurrection, those who claimed to be witnesses, there were really no reporters and certainly no video. Nevertheless, we claim that this is news and good news. It is not journalism because it is not disinterested. It is the word of witnesses whose own lives were changed and who therefore wanted to change the lives of others and to affect the course of the world and to do justice and to heal and to love. You may have noticed that there were two very powerful readings today Walter's family drew on their own inclinations and knowledge of Scripture to pick them. The first was one from St. Paul, his letter to the Romans, part of his passionate wisdom. If you read it closely, you will find that this is the wisdom of all the great living religions, and it was one of the first claims of Christianity that in some ways it was not going to be different from what went before. It was going to pass on great wisdom. Let love be genuine, Paul said to the Romans. Hate what is evil, hold fast to what is good. 
love one another with mutual affection, outdo one another in showing honor. Only people who believe that they are loved can show that kind of love. Do not lag in zeal. Be ardent in spirit. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Show hospitality to strangers. These, again, are the hallmarks today of true religion and are the things that when we see them in others, great people and people of no name, we know that we have seen the truth. But all great witnesses and all great reporters know that the truth begins with that last word that Paul left with the Romans. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. That means you have to dig for the truth and then you have to live the truth. Trust is built on that kind of work. And then they drew on one of the great sailing stories in the Bible. Some friends of Jesus were out on the Sea of Galilee, a little lake but subject to squalls. And there was a storm and he was asleep. He was a daredevil on the sea. And they didn't like that. But the lesson he ultimately taught them, he did what no sailor I know can do, he calmed the storm. But when he did, he showed them that it really is a way to live your life if you can afford not to be so anxious. To be the least anxious person in the boat is a gift to everyone else. But we are anxious, generation after generation. We look at the events of the world, we look at the conditions of the day, and it makes us anxious. But occasionally someone comes along who says, I have dug, I have looked for the truth, I have witnessed it to you. And in the end, all will be well if we dig for the truth. It's not the story or even the ultimate truth that makes the difference in the end. It is, as Paul said, our ability to show the truth with love. Let love be, general, be genuine. Hate what is evil. And do not claim to be wiser than you are. Amen. Now will you stand please? In the assurance of eternal life given at baptism, let us proclaim our faith and say, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now let us join in the words that Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Almighty God, who has knit together thine elect in one communion and fellowship in the mystical body of thy Son, Christ our Lord, grant we beseech thee to thy whole church in paradise and on earth, thy light and thy peace. Grant to us who are still in our pilgrimage and who walk as yet by faith, 
that thy Holy Spirit may lead us in holiness and righteousness all our days. Grant to all who mourn a sure confidence in thy fatherly care, that casting all their grief on thee, they may know the consolation of thy love. Amen. Give courage and faith to those who are bereaved, and especially to this family, that they may have strength to meet the days ahead in the comfort of a reasonable and holy hope in the joyful expectation of eternal life with those they love. Help us, we pray, in the midst of things we cannot understand, to believe and trust in the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection to life everlasting. Amen. Grant us grace to entrust Walter to thy never-failing love. Receive him into the arms of thy mercy, and remember him according to the favor which thou bearest unto thy people. Amen. And grant that increasing in knowledge and love of thee, he may go from strength to strength in the life of perfect service in thy heavenly kingdom. Amen. Please be seated.
I first met Walter Cronkite under a piano. It was a big party. Betty Furness had given it up at her apartment up at 86th Street. I was producing the original Tonight Show with Steve Allen, and we didn't get through till one o'clock in the morning, so I was very late for the party. And uh, I saw a man under this, uh, in the well of the piano there, and a big pillow. All the seats were taken. It was jammed. And he waved at me to come and sit to an empty pillow next to him, which I did. And during our first meeting, over a half a century ago, we learned that we both had boats and loved sailing. Walter was a better sailor than I was. When I had my sailboat and uh, the wind got down to a half a knot or a knot, I'd always turn the engine on and get going. Not Walter, he would wait for the breeze. We sailed together from Maine to the Virgin Islands. In the yachting language, Walter Cronkite would be called a one-off. He was, a, he was a, absolutely an original. Whatever place he was or in any room, it always was more fun. He was truly a life enhancer. Just a few days ago, with Kathy Cronkite and Marlene Adler at his bedside, I took his hand and whispered, Walter, let's go sailing. His eyes lit up and he smiled. I recited a poem with only slight modification because I wanted to make it more personal. And Kathy asked me to share it with you. So with apologies to John Maysfield, I looked at water and said, you must go down to the sea again, to the lonely sea and sky. And all you ask is a tall ship and a star to steer by. And the wheels kick and the wind song and the white sail shaking and a gray mist on the sea's face and a gray dawn breaking. You must go down to the sea again, for the call of the running tide is a wild call and a clear call that may not be denied. And all you ask for is a windy day with the white clouds flying. And, excuse me, I'm getting a little rough here with me. Oh yes, and the flung spray, and the blown spume, and the seagulls crying. You must go down to the sea again, to the vagrant gypsy's life, the uncle's way, and the whale's way, and the wind's like a whetted knife, and all you ask for is a merry yarn from a laughing fella rover, and a quiet sleep and a sweet dream when the long trick is over. Good sailing, Walter. Splice the main brace. This next hymn is a family favorite. It is a hymn that expresses someone who knows and loves his own country but is also a citizen of the world. I think you'll recognize the tune, Finlandia, the words are printed in the bulletin. This is my song.
I invite you all to join in this final commendation. Give rest, O Christ, to thy servant with thy saints, where sorrow and pain are no more, neither sighing but life everlasting. Thou only art immortal, the creator and maker of mankind, and we are mortal, formed of the earth, and unto earth shall we return. For so thou didst ordain when thou createst me, saying, Dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. All we go down to the dust, yet even at the grave we make our song, Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. Give rest, O Christ, to thy servant with thy saints, where sorrow and pain are no more, neither sighing but life everlasting. Now into thy hands, O merciful Savior, we commend thy servant Walter. Acknowledge, we humbly beseech thee, a sheep of thine own fold, a lamb of thine own flock, a sinner of thine own redeeming. Receive him into the arms of thy mercy, into the blessed rest of everlasting peace, and into the glorious company of the saints in light. Amen. Life is short, and we do not have too much time to gladden the hearts of those who travel the way with us. So be swift to love, make haste to be kind, and may God's blessing, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be with you and remain with you always. Amen. Let us go forth in the name of Christ. Thanks be to God.